Hey everybody, this is Joshua Lewis with The Remnant Radio. The video you're about to watch is a production from our ministry. Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We broadcast every Monday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time here on YouTube. Uh, we have different pastors, teachers from different churches and denominations coming on the show to discuss a wide range of theological topics. Many of our guests we agree with and many of our de guests we disagree with, but our goal is to understand God's word so that we can then understand the God who has given us his word. Uh, so we hope that you enjoy this conversation. We we hope it's been a benefit to you. Uh, if you do enjoy this video and want to continue to help us produce content like this, we'd ask that you go down into the description of the video and donate. There's a, a description link there in the video, and it would help us continue producing content just like this. Be blessed. Hey guys, we're talking about amillennialism today with Dr. Sam Storms. I hope that you are as excited as we are in studio. We are, man, we're pumped. Really excited. Apologize. So pumped. We're a little bit behind schedule because of technical difficulties, but hey, we've got a great program for you. We wanted to make sure uh, that we had everything kind of set so we would have to restart. But uh, uh, Michael, tell us a little bit about uh, Corona Life before we dive into the, to the conversation. Corona Life, uh, well. How are you in the family? <laughs> we're, we're doing well. It was a little strange doing Easter yesterday, yeah. uh, you know, all virtually, but... Uh, you know, but Josh is really helping us here, uh, here. And we're going to use the podcast room and all of that. And so, uh, anyway, so I hear like a Skype call in my, <laughs> yeah, that's so weird. <laughs> Dr. Storms, are you there? I'm here. Okay. Okay. As Excellent. long as you're there, we're good. Yeah, keep going. Okay. Anyway, so it's all good, Josh. It's all good. <laughs> So, um, so we do have Dr. Storms on the show with us and, uh, Dr. Storms, could you just maybe take a moment, introduce us to yourself, introduce us to, uh, your ministry? Sure. Um, well, I was born and raised here in Oklahoma, went to the university of Oklahoma, uh, Dallas theological seminary after that, which will catch many people by surprise when they hear my particular eschatological views, um, <laughs> Pastored in the Dallas area for about 12 years, also in Oklahoma for another eight years. Then I went up to Kansas City as part of Metro Christian Fellowship there for seven years. Taught at Wheaton College for four years up near Chicago, just outside of Chicago. Yeah. Uh, we moved back to Oklahoma City in 2008, and I'm the senior pastor here at Bridgeway. Uh, coming up on the end of 12 years here. So, wow. Um, we're... We're loving it. How, we enjoy it here. How was virtual Easter yesterday? <laughs> it was virtually okay. <laughs> I, I don't know what to do about all this. I, yeah. Man, it's um, it's a strange time. I I hope that we'll look back on this and be able to find some degree of humor in it, but I know for many people it's devastating and anything but funny. I mean, losing jobs and some yeah. people losing lives, but uh, it is, uh, it's really bizarre. It really is. It is bizarre. Well, this is interesting because we, we set up this conversation in advance, right? We were we were talking about having you come on the show and talk about end times and amillennialism way before uh, all the coronavirus stuff happened. We, we had stuff scheduled with... Uh, um, uh, Craig Keener uh, with yourself. I have Casey Doss coming on tomorrow to talk about uh, end times as well. Uh, so so uh, it, it's interesting that this kind of hit, and I think it seems to be providential because people have a lot of questions in this season uh, about the end times. Is is coronavirus involved in that? And I, I suppose this might be a good uh, opportunity to kind of get that question maybe out of the way because I know it's going to be coming into the feed. <laughs> do you think coronavirus has something to do with the eschatological time clock? I wish that I were wise enough to give you a answer on that. Um, I do believe that, you know, I my understanding of the book of Revelation, um, which will probably come out later anyway, is that it describes um, kind of what I call the commonplaces of life in mm. the present church age. In other words, um, the, the various seal, trumpet, and bold judgments are describing in varying degrees of intensity, what has happened since the exaltation of Jesus and will continue to happen until he returns. And so when I read about the fourth seal judgment uh, in Revelation 6, it mentions plagues and pestilence. Mm -hmm. um, but again, th what we're going through now is simply not unprecedented. I mean, there, there have been so many instances of these kinds of uh, devastating plagues that are far, far worse, far more lethal than what mm -hmm. we're experiencing now. And, you know, every, you know, you go back in the middle of the second century, the middle of the fourth century. Uh, of course, everybody knows about the Black Death in the 
14th, 15th, 16th centuries, where one third of uh, Europe died. I mean, that's massive. Yeah. Um, so there have been plagues, pestilences throughout the whole course of church history. For us to pinpoint this one, oh, well, that definitively proves we're close to the second coming of Jesus. I, I, I don't think that we have the, the, what I call the hermeneutical liberty to do that. Um, do I hope that that's true? Sure. Yeah. Uh, do I think it could be true? Sure. Do I think it is true? I don't know. Yeah. Sure. So, so we're gonna go with that classic. You reserve the right to change your view on the eschatology <laughs> midair, right? Like when, yeah. when we're all being caught up, we can all change our views to the right one the second we're getting raptured up. So, uh, uh, anyway, when when talking about amillennialism, let us know what, what is amillennialism. People have heard of uh, uh, pre-trib and post-trib. That's a conversation that we're having constantly. Uh, the idea of historic premillennialism, I think, is a, is a popular phrase that gets thrown around, but I just don't hear amillennialism all that often. And for those who are viewing who are not familiar with that terminology, that theological phrase, uh, help us understand what is amillennialism. Well, the name itself is misleading because it suggests that, that we who believe this view don't believe in a millennium, and we do. Uh, I mean, you have to. You, Revelation 20 talks about a thousand-year reign, so there's definitely a millennium. What, we, what we're denying by that little alpha privative, that A that we tack on in front of the word millennial, is that there will be a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ on the earth following his second coming and preceding the introduction of the new heavens and new earth. So, um, the, the kind of the standard premillennial view is that at the second coming of Christ, uh, Jesus will establish an earthly reign upon the earth. He'll reign for a thousand years, at the end of which there will be obviously a rebellion by Satan and unbelievers. They'll be crushed. And then we have Revelation 21 and 22, the inauguration of uh, the new heavens and new earth, or what we call the eternal state. Our millennialists believe in a millennium. We just don't believe it's a literal 1,000-year uh, kingdom on the earth between the second coming and the new heavens and new earth. I believe that the millennium that's being described in Revelation 20 is happening now in what we call the intermediate state. Um, so, for example, um, my dad died in 1983. He's a wonderful Christian man. He's he is in what we call the intermediate state. He is in heaven, conscious, alive in the presence of Christ, and all other saints who have died uh, throughout the course of this present age. And they, my father and all other believers, are reigning with Christ as he exercises his sovereign rule over the nations and over human history, uh, which will be consummated at the time of the second coming. So I believe the millennium is an indeterminate length of time. What is it now? Spanned... Uh, um, gosh, what will we say? 1990 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, uh, it will, it will continue uh, until the, uh, second coming of Christ at the end of history. So it's something that, it, it, so I do believe in a millennium. I just don't believe that the word there means a literal thousand years. In fact, everywhere in the Bible where the number 1000 is used, it's always symbolic. It's figurative. Um, so I believe that that is what is being described in Revelation 20. So, uh, I believe that when Christ returns, um, one uh, dimension of what will happen when he returns is he will create or inaugurate the new heavens and the new earth or the eternal state. So, okay. you know, I, that's kind of amillennialism in a nutshell. I, I would say one other thing, though, that uh, I think people misunderstand this view. They tend to think that we've kind of spiritualized all of the promises throughout the Bible of God's people dwelling in the land and ruling with Christ on the earth. And I believe that we will live on the land and dwell with Christ on the earth. It's just the new earth. It's not this present earth. Mm. It's the new earth that is inaugurated in Revelation 21 and 22. Okay. Awesome. 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 So, uh, Sam, you began by talking about uh, your history at Dallas Theological Seminary, and mm -hmm. and one of the things you said is you you might not have guessed that I would be a millennial based on this, and yeah. so uh, so maybe you could dive into uh, give us a little bit of an autobiographical sketch of your sure. migration from a pre-trib rapture premillennialist over to 
the amillennial camp. What was it in Scripture? What was it that contributed to that migration for you? Well, the first shift was when I abandoned the preacher of rapture, and that was largely due to um, the writings of Robert Gundry, his book, The Church and Tribulation, and also George Eldon Ladd, hmm. his book called The Blessed Hope. Uh, so I became post-trib on the issue of the rapture, uh, but kind of simultaneous with that was my uh, moving away from uh, dispensationalism, which is the view uh, that's advocated at Dallas. And it, it came about, I think, rather providentially, um, I was in my say, let's it would have been in my second year at Dallas. I was taking a Greek exegesis course in the book of Ephesians, and uh, the professor just randomly assigned each of the students a particular paragraph in Ephesians, and that's what we had to write our exegetical paper on. Well, mine was Ephesians 2, 11 through 22, or yeah, 11 through 22. And as I began to dig into this passage, it seemed to me that um, this idea of this radical distinction between Israel and the church was something that was not found in the passage. In fact, the very opposite was seen. It was Paul saying that uh, Gentiles who in the Old Testament were without Christ, separate from the covenants uh, of the commonwealth of Israel and the covenants of promise. But now in Christ, he says, you've been brought near. You've been made fellow heirs. You've been made citizens of the commonwealth of Israel. You're co-heirs of all the promises given to the fathers. And this wall of division between Jew and Gentile has been broken down. And God has created one new man, Christ, It's called the church. So that passage was kind of the end for dispensationalism for me. Mm -hmm. uh, because dispensationalism is largely based on this distinction between Israel and the church. And then in conjunction with that, I read uh, George Ladd's book, The Presence of the Future, and that kind of sealed it. Hmm. So by the time I graduated from Dallas, uh, I was pretty much on my way uh, out of a dispensational pre-trib, pre-mill view. Still kind of tentatively held it, but not long after graduation, that all changed. And um, uh, I, I was reading a lot of things like uh, Anthony Hokema's book, The Bible in the Future, uh, that helped me tremendously and uh, eventually embraced an amillennial view. Yeah, and we actually did a, a uh, recommended reading for amillennialism books, uh, and you guys can go check that out on the YouTube page. It was released today at 8 o'clock. My buddy Dawson, uh, who uh, he, he did a lot of research on which were the best amillennial books. We have uh, Dr. Storm's book right here, so if you guys want to pick this up, uh, just go ahead and say, hey, shoot me a book. Uh, in the comment section, I'd love to win this book, and we'll do a raffle at the end of the video, uh, probably probably sometime next week, so people have enough time to, to view it, and then we'll, we'll ship it out to you sometime this week. Uh, uh, so tell us a little bit about the book. How, how, how is this book, how was it formed? When we did the video, we said it was kind of your, your breakup letter with uh, d uh, dispensationalism. <laughs> tell us a little bit about uh, the book, and, and what are the contents uh, that people are to expect in here? Yeah. Wow. Well, that book was the product of about, um, gosh, 20, about 30 years, 35. Um, I initially wrote a book defending amillennialism in about 1985. And um, I just felt, I, you know, the manuscript was done. It was much, probably about a third the size of that one. And I just felt like I needed to wait. I just wanted to, I was continuing to develop in my understanding of biblical eschatology. So I taught numerous courses. I taught through the book of Revelation probably four or five times. Um, I preached uh, through, you know, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, Mark 13, a number of times. And so I uh, preached, uh, obviously taught through the book of Daniel and eventually all of this, I thought, well, I just need to put all this together. And so um, that's really how the book came about. Um, there are a number of things that obviously I couldn't cover in the book. Uh, I think some people wish that I had been done more in the Old Testament. Uh, probably would have been great, but it would have been, a, you know, a book about <laughs> the size of Gruden and yeah. systematic theology if I'd done that. <laughs> um, and um, so I figured, you know, what is it? I'm looking at it now. It's about almost 700 pages. I think that's big enough. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I covered I, what I thought were the main themes. Um, you know, I respond to dispensationalism. Um, I have, uh, I think probably the most important chapter is the one called Problems with Premillennialism. 
Um, and the way in which I came to reject the premillennial view, which I can share um, um, briefly if you want me to, uh, I have several chapters on the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, which I think primarily pertains to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Um, I have a couple of chapters on the Antichrist, uh, on the nature of the book of Revelation, and then, of course, Revelation 20. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's kind of a in a sense, a hodgepodge of themes, but they are all united if you read consecutively through the book. Although people can jump into any chapter at any time, I think, and uh, uh, get help. So that's kind of how it came about. Hmm. Okay. Well, so here's my question. Do you agree with John Calvin that premillennialism is intolerable blasphemy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just, no, yeah. no, he not. actually did I, say that. Yeah. But uh, I know you don't think that. But uh, you did mention problems with, uh, with premillennialism. Uh, yeah. tell, tell us, what, the, what are those problems? Well, this is this is basically when I made the shift from uh, pre-mill uh, to a-mill. Um, I was what I did was I sat down and over a lengthy period of time, I read through the New Testament and I took note of everything that is said will happen uh, with the second coming of Christ. In other words, when Jesus comes back, what happens? And what I discovered was that numerous things happen that, in my opinion, preclude the possibility of the so-called millennium of premillennialism. So let me just kind of let me just state this to make it very clear. If you're a premillennialist, whether you're a dispensational or historic premill, you have to believe that physical death will continue after the second coming of Jesus. They all premillennialists, premillennialists believe that. People will die physically in their millennium. You have to believe that the natural creation, the material world, will continue to labor under the curse that was imposed uh, when Adam fell. You have to believe that the new heavens and new earth won't happen for 1,000 years after the second coming of Jesus. You have to believe that unbelieving men and women will still have opportunity to come to faith after the second coming of Jesus. Uh, you have to believe that unbelievers won't be resurrected until at least a thousand years after the coming of Jesus. And you have to believe that unbelievers will not be judged and cast into the lake of fire until a thousand years after the second coming. Now, a lot of premillennialists who hear that say, well, yeah, of course, that's, that's what we believe. And my point was, I don't think the New Testament allows any of those. As I read the New Testament, it seemed to me clear that when Christ comes back, Death is swallowed up in victory. It's the end, the termination of all physical death. The natural creation is delivered from the curse and is redeemed. Uh, the new heavens and the new earth come simultaneously with the second coming of Jesus. Um, all opportunity to come to saving faith ends at the second coming of Jesus. People can't come to faith subsequent to it. Um, the resurrection of all, both the elect and non-elect, as well as the judgment of, of unbelievers, all happen simultaneous with the second coming. So I'm faced with, with all of these statements about what happens when Jesus returns, but I can't believe any of them if I'm premillennial, because I've got to have all those things happening subsequent to the return of Christ. So I was just I was just left with no other conclusion than that when Jesus comes back, death is physical death ends, the resurrection happens, the judgment happens, the natural creation is redeemed and set free from the curse. Um, it's it's the termination of all opportunity to believe in Christ for salvation. So that's kind of how that was kind of the final nail in the coffin of premillennialism for me. Excellent. Hey, so um, I've, I've got a question here about uh, the, the temple being destroyed in 70 AD. You, you just said um, just there that you believe that certain of those events had, t had already taken place. It seems to kind of be a kind of a partial preterist position. Uh, uh, Stephen asks the questions, you know, he says, well, he, he makes a statement here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not positive. Uh, uh, I trust Stephen. I like Stephen. I'm assuming he's sourcing you correctly. Uh, but he says uh, that you believe that the book of Revelation was... 
uh, uh, written before the destruction of the temple, and yet in the first couple of chapters uh, that certain of the prophecies given are fulfilled in 70 AD, how, how do you square those two things, that the, that the book was written uh, prior to 70 AD, and yet uh, certain events are fulfilled in the first couple of chapters of Revelation? But before you answer that question, or maybe disagree with that question, a quick word from our sponsors. We're going to do this a little bit differently instead of doing a video. Crew, can I have you play that music there? Uh, we have a Stonebridge Worship uh, that has come out with this uh, this album. You can check it out on Spotify. We would really encourage you to go check out their music. They're dropping songs every single week, uh, and I say every single week, uh, every other week, uh, leading up to the month of June, where they're going to release their whole album. It's an awesome album. You should check it out. We're really thankful for them sponsoring the show. We're actually going to play this full song at the end of the video. So we'll go to black, and then we'll just kind of play that music out there at the end. That's kind of the way that. We're going to go out. Uh, so so thank you, crew, for playing that. And if you guys would, go ahead and check out Stonebridge Worship there on Spotify. But, but back to the question, uh, Dr. Storms, how do you square that? If the book was written before 70 AD, and yet their prophetic events are, are, are quoting things that have already happened at the destruction of the temple, is that, is that correct? I don't, I don't believe that Revelation was written before 70 AD. So you believe that uh, Revelation that. was written after 70 AD? Yes. Yeah, so, I believe it was written at the end of the first century, probably in the early 90s. So if it was written after, and that's probably why I misunderstood the question, if the event was written after, do some of the prophecies to the first couple of churches, uh, in, or the first couple of churches, the first couple of chapters, uh, were those events um, supposed to be about the destruction of the temple? Maybe I'm misunderstanding Stephen, no. Stephen's question. No. Go ahead. No, I believe, I, I believe that Matthew 24 is describing events leading from the time of the exaltation of Christ at the right hand of the Father mm -hmm. around 33 A.D. up until 70 A.D. But I believe that the book of Revelation was written toward the end of the first century, most likely around 95 A.D. I take the traditional view in terms gotcha. of the dating of the book of Revelation. So, um, so, so no, I don't, I don't see a conflict there. Maybe I'm not understanding your question, but uh, no, I do not believe yeah. Revelation was written. I think it might have been a confusion between Revelation and the, all of the discourse statement that you were making. Mm, I, I'm right. reading into it, maybe. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. But, uh, well, let's talk about the all of the discourse uh, for a moment, Dr. Storms. Uh, what would you say are some of the primary misconceptions that people have in their understanding of the all of the discourse? Yeah, the primary misunderstanding, in my opinion, is that people think that Jesus is talking about the end of the current church age. And I don't think that's it. I think he's talking about the end of the Jewish age that was consummated with God's judgment against the, the Israel in the destruction of the temple and the city um, through the Roman armies in 70 AD. Uh, you know, when I don't know how you get around this. When you read Matthew 24, for example, um, they leave the temple. Um, they came and they sit on the mountain. They point at the temple and and, and they say, you know, What's going to come of this? And Jesus says, I tell you, there will not be left here one stone upon another until uh, that will not be thrown down. And he's talking about the temple they just walked out of, the temple they're looking at from the Mount of Olives. They're asking him about it. And he says, this temple is going to be destroyed. And then I believe he begins to give signs of um, that will take place between the, the time he's talking and the time that the temple is actually destroyed in 70 years. 70 AD. Um, I think one of the problems, one of the reasons why people tend to project this into the future uh, as if it's talking about the end of the church age is because of verse 14, where Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. But the interesting thing is that phrase translated the whole world um, is, is, a, is a word that is used consistently throughout the New Testament to refer to the then inhabited Roman Empire. Um, you know, back in uh, Luke's gospel, it talks about the, when the whole world was going to be taxed. Well, he's talking about the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. um, our problem, I think, is that we live obviously in a 21st century in a highly global mentality where we understand um, what the what the earth is, that contains Australia and Indonesia and Russia and South Africa and Antarctica. But we need to put ourselves in the mindset of the first century and of the mindset of the people to whom Jesus was speaking. And the whole world to them was the inhabited earth, the Roman Empire. 
And I think Jesus is saying there that prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, that the gospel would spread to the Gentile nations surrounding Israel, and then the end will come, namely the end of the Jewish age, the end of the temple, the end of, of God's unique relationship to Israel as his sole covenant people. So now let me, let me say one more thing. Having said that, I think it is decidedly and distinctly possible. It's decidedly, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should say it's <laughs> distinctly possible that what we read is going to happen from 33 to 70 AD is a something of a template that is happening on a local scale then that will happen on a global scale mm -hmm. as we approach the end of the age in which we now live. So it's entirely possible that the reason why we read similarities between the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation is because what Jesus is saying is going to happen locally in Israel in mm -hmm. the first century was a pattern, as it were, or maybe a blueprint for what's going to happen on a cosmic or global scale at the end of the age. Hmm. So that's that, a lot to that's, No, that's digest, great. So maybe I should better slow uh, down and stop. Are, are there, uh, can you, are there any sort of like other prophetic examples from the Old Testament and how they play out where we see something like a pattern uh, that repeats itself so we can say, ah, this is an interpretive principle where we say this, it could be that, uh, that way with the Olivet Discourse? Yeah, I think there are. Um, just trying to think of them right off the top of my head. Um, certainly, just the two comings of Christ the, itself, mm -hmm. I mean, the first coming, the second coming. Um, there are there are times in the Old Testament where you can't really determine or discern which coming he's describing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the old analogy has been used. It's like you're... Um, you're looking at two mountain peaks and you can't see the, the huge valley that uh, lies between them. And so they look as if they are right next to each other or on top of each other. Um, so, yeah, there are there are certain things that were said about the first coming of Christ um, that oftentimes uh, reflect patterns or principles or events that we also believe will happen at the time of the second coming. So mm -hmm. certainly I think that that is the case. Um given the fact that uh, most of those to whom Jesus first came in the first century thought that he was bringing the consummation of the kingdom when, in fact, he was only inaugurating it, and uh, the consummation wouldn't come, obviously, until after the church age. Okay. All right. I, I want to come back to the uh, the Olivet Discourse for a moment uh, to a couple of passages that I, I'm curious if you understand these uh, to be a reference to the paralgia, the, the second coming. Um, or something different. So, uh, uh, for instance, th this is one, I, there are pretty different interpretations of this one, but I'd, I'm just going to, uh, to read it. It says, then, uh, this is Matthew 24, verse 30, uh, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he'll send out his angels in a loud trumpet call and gather the elect from the four winds. Okay, mm -hmm. um, how do you understand that? Do you understand that to be a reference to the second coming, or do you understand that to be sort of uh, a, the vindication of Jesus, uh, not necessarily the second coming? Well, primarily the first thing you said, but possibly also the second. Let me explain what I mean. Um, when it says they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, it's a quote from Daniel chapter 7. And he here's the problem. People hear the language of the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, and they think it's talking about a descent from heaven to earth uh, that's describing the second coming, the parousia. But in Daniel chapter 7, it's describing the coming of the Son of Man to the Ancient of Days in heaven to receive glory and power and the authority to rule his kingdom. So I think that what Jesus is talking about is when, um, when you see the impending destruction of Jerusalem, Jerusalem surrounded by armies, the temple is destroyed, the city is razed. He said, this is the sign on earth of the Son of Man in heaven receiving vindication and being shown to be who he really is. Uh, so I think it's primarily a reference 
to what took place not on earth at the second coming, but what took place in heaven as Jesus is vindicated before his accusers as truly being the Son of God, the Messiah. Um, now, having said that, is it possible that the same language could be used to describe his coming at the end of church history to consummate his kingdom? And yeah, the answer to that is, yeah, it's possible. I have to be given some clear evidence substantiating that, which I haven't yet seen, but I'm open to the possibility. But I think the primary reference is to, is to what the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem indicated um, in terms of the vindication, as you use the word, that's a good word, the vindication of, of the claims of Christ to be who he said he is. You know, it's like when he was standing at his trial and he told the, the high priest, you will see the Son of Man coming in power with great glory. Um, they understood right. what he was claiming. They knew Daniel 7 by heart. And he was basically saying, I am the Son of Man. I am the Messianic ruling king, and I will be vindicated, and you will be alive mm -hmm. to see it happen. Right. He well, says, from now on. You know, that, had, that had to be something that took place in the first century. Right. Because he says in so Matthew 26, 64, I think it is, he says, from now on, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Mm -hmm. And that's baffled so many people. I wanted to bring it up because I think a lot of times when we read Matthew 24, we're just like, we're looking for all the signs and the newspaper articles and all of these things. And, and then every time we see up oh, coming on the clouds of heaven, that means Jesus is going to be coming on the cloud, literal clouds of heaven. Well, well maybe, but is that what that verse is saying? And, right. and I think when you cross reference for me, the deal breaker was cross referencing it. Well, yes, with Daniel seven. And then also Matthew 26, 64, where he's, literally uh he's literally saying from now on this moment forward you're going to see this so i appreciate the nuance that you that you bring to that yeah up. matthew baldwin yeah. i'm just gonna take a question from one of our from our audience here he talks about how does a millennial position account for two resurrections uh he says uh, if this was a, a spiritual resurrection it would seem like this would be before the beheading or, or the took of the mark of the beast what are your thoughts okay so that's back to revelation 20 there mm -hmm. right so my understanding is that Revelation 20 is primarily addressing those who are going to be martyred for their faith, uh, because he talks about those who have been beheaded mm -hmm. for the testimony of Jesus, for the word of God, those who had not worshipped the beast or its image. And I think he's saying that although you die physically at the hands of the beast, you live spiritually in the presence of Christ, and you share his reign, you share his rule over the earth and over the events of history. Um, and then, at and, and I think he's saying that that will transpire for a thousand years, which I take to be a symbolic or figurative reference to the period of the church age in which we live. Who knows how much longer it will go? I hope it's not much longer, but it may be. And then at the end of that, there will be a physical resurrection um, you know, it's described for us also in 1 Corinthians 15 when, when Christ returns. 1 Thessalonians 4 describes it as well. When the dead in Christ will be um, raised first and we will be, we will receive our glorified bodies. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think what, uh, what Matthew Baldwin might be getting at, uh, Matthew, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what he's trying to, uh, to get at is, uh, like, let's take John five, for instance, where, where Jesus says the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God. So he speaks of a, a future physical from the grave resurrection. And he also speaks of the spiritual resurrection, much like Paul right. in Ephesians two, we were dead in Christ and we were made alive. And so, and so we have the resurrection when we are born again, and then we have the resurrection at the end of time. But it would seem as though the amillennial position has a third resurrection as well, which is when people, when their spirit goes to heaven, when they die. And, it, it, and so he's asking, is that what you're saying? I, I think that's what he's what he's. Oh, I wouldn't at. call it a third resurrection. I, I think in terms of Revelation 20, I don't. Now, some amillennialists believe that the first resurrection in Revelation 20 is a reference to regeneration mm -hmm. when we're born again. Okay. I don't think that's what's being described there. I think what's being described is the entrance into the intermediate state, the spiritual life that is granted believers on their death as they hold fast to, uh, to their faith mm -hmm. in the face of the threat of martyrdom. So 
Okay. My understanding is that's the first resurrection. The second resurrection, uh, obviously, is uh, the physical one at the end of the age. Okay. So, um, you know, okay. I just, I would... Um, you would just dispute that, yeah. I'm, I'm looking back over in, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 6, when um, he's talking about the fifth seal. And he says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And he's obviously talking about those who have died for their faith, and they are now in the intermediate state. They are in the presence of Christ, and the same language, the exact same language that we find in Revelation 6, which everybody agrees is a reference to the intermediate state, is what we find in Revelation 20. I saw the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony they bore. That's the exact language we find in Revelation chapter 20. I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus for the word of God. Um, so I don't know how you can look at Revelation 20 and compare it with Revelation 6 and not conclude he's talking about the same individuals and the same event. Okay. It's entrance right. into the intermediate state. Yeah. Okay. Can I read uh, Revelation 20 verses 4 and 5? And I want to ask a question about that phrase came to life in reference to the believers in Christ and also in reference to those uh, who do not know Christ. Okay. So, um, so verse 4, he sees thrones, then he sees the souls who were beheaded, uh, and then those who had not worshipped the beast, etc. So these who had not worshipped the beast, these believers, it says they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So this is, you're speaking of the so uh, these these martyrs, some of them now in heaven, right? Uh, reigning. All of them now yes. in heaven. Yes, so right now in heaven, reigning uh, with Christ. Okay, so this would be a... So came to life in verse 4 would speak of a spiritual resurrection. Uh, verse 5, then it says the rest of the dead did not come to life. Now I'm assuming rest of the dead, do you understand that to mean unbelievers? Or do you understand? Yes. Okay, so unbelievers did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. So what would you say if I was to uh, maybe offer very humbly some pushback here, um, that it would seem perhaps that we're using the word come to life in these two adjacent verses in, in two different ways. And someone yes. might say, well, that, uh, well, Dr. Storms, that seems like an inconsistent interpretation to say come to life means a spiritual resurrection in verse four, but in verse five, it speaks of a physical resurrection. How, how would you respond to that? Well, the response, and again, I go into great detail on this and respond to your question in my book. Uh, I probably can't recall off the top of my head everything I say there. But we have to ask the question whether there are contextual clues that indicate that there, are, that there is a distinction uh, in these two resurrections. And I think, the, I think the context indicates that that is the case. Two things in particular. One is that there's an intervening 1,000 years. The, the millennial kingdom, whatever it is, intervenes between the two. And then secondly, it's the use of the ordinal first and the ordinal second. This is the only place in the entire Bible that the ordinal first is appended to the word resurrection. And I go into great, it's it's somewhat complex argument, but I go into uh, some detail in my book over John's use of the ordinals first and second and also old and new, or former and new. And so I think that there are some contextual clues that indicate he's using these words in two different senses. And then also, we have, you mentioned John 5, I think we have an example there in the, in the same context where two different types of resurrection are mm-hmm. referenced as well. So I don't think it's impossible. Um, in fact, I, I cite several texts in my book where we have um, this kind of language used all in the same, uh, kind of the same breath, as it were, but it's referring to two different realities, two different types of resurrection. Awesome. awesome. Excellent. I've, I've got a question from uh, Dawson. Uh, Dawson, whoop, I lost it. Here he goes. Oh, yeah, he says, uh, Ken Riddlebacher uh, argues that the two-age model should be the interpretive grid. Uh, he focused on Jesus and Paul's teaching. Could you elaborate on this viewpoint, if possible? Uh, he'd have to clarify, what does he mean by the two-age model? 
because that language is thrown around a lot. I want to make sure I know what he means. Sure. Uh, maybe I'll wait for Dawson to give some clarification. Help drop that in. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Dawson, while you offer a little bit of clarification, let's just stick with the millennial for a moment. And Dr. Storms, I know this is a question you must get all the time, but uh, what, what a premillennialist is, is is going to say any time that we're we're talking about the millennium and, and the view of all millennialism uh, is, hey, you know, throwing Satan into an abyss so that he can't sure. deceive the the nations anymore. Hey, I I I get Matthew twelve where it says that Satan was, you know, that the the strong man has to be bound, and I get that Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers. Colossians chapter two. I get that you know the serpent's head was crushed uh, at the cross, and yet at the same time we see so much deception that Satan is is performing, depending on how you sure. translate Revelation or understand Revelation 12, that Satan still out in the world seems to be deceiving and causing a lot of damage. And he's, you know, second Corinthians four, he's blinding the minds of unbelievers, yep. et cetera. So, uh, so how would you respond to convince the premillennialist, Hey, uh, sure. this binding is, uh, it, you're, I can tell you're ready to answer it. So I'm just going to let you I'm jump ready in. To answer it. <laughs> By the way, just so you know, literally yesterday, I submitted my new book on spiritual warfare to my publisher. Okay. And uh, hopefully it'll be out sometime next year, about this time. And so definitely, I believe that Satan is prowling about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Mm -hmm. I think he was very active. He's obviously on a leash. He, he's, you know, he, there are certain things that God will not permit him to do. So the question, obviously, is how can we say that Satan is active in that sense and demons are active? At the same time that he is seized, um, you know, bound, thrown into the pit, shut it, sealed it over him. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is very clear. Let's read the passage together and listen to what God says. He says, just pick it up in verse 3, and he threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him. Why? So that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. Ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So the distinct purpose, the sole purpose for this binding, is that he might not deceive the nations until the millennial kingdom is over. Well, deceive them in what sense? Well, we're told explicitly down in verse 7, which describes him being released from this pit. I'm reading verse 7, and when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. And then it goes on to describe, obviously, their destruction uh, at that battle. So we have to ask the question, with respect to what is Satan bound? With respect to what is he sealed and absolutely prevented from doing? And the answer is, he is prevented and he is bound and prohibited and restrained from deceiving the nations of the earth to, to provoke what I would call a premature Armageddon. How do we know that? Because when he's released, that's precisely what he does. He goes out to deceive the nations to do what? To gather them for battle. And of course, we read about that battle in the next um, two or three verses. John does not say that Satan is bound and shut up in a, in a pit and prohibited from tempting people or prowling about seeking people to devour or blinding the minds of the unbelieving so they don't believe the gospel. He is specifically said to be bound up and prevented from provoking Armageddon prematurely. His intent was to launch a global assault against the people of God at the time of the first coming of Christ. And this text is telling us that decisive steps have been taken to prevent that from happening. Hmm. He will not be allowed to, 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 as it were, mobilize the unbelieving nations of the earth to launch a global assault on the people of God until the millennial kingdom is over. So I don't have any problem at all in, in talking about the activity of Satan in the present age, and yet at the same time saying there is a sense in which he is decisively and permanently bound and prohibited because John tells us in respect of what? Namely, he cannot gather the nations of the earth 
to bring about this global assault against the people of God until after the millennium. So, so I don't see any problem at all. I know it's a big problem. Premillennialists throw it at me all the time. <laughs> I think John, you just read John's words. He's pretty clear. And that, that's actually a, a great follow-up question, because uh, when I look at the premillennialist view and the or the, the post-millennialist view, those those two positions, the, the premillennialists seem to say, like, hey, things are going to get worse, and then they're going to get better. And then the, 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 the post-millennial view is like, hey, things are going to get better. How does the amillennial view kind of view uh, the state that we're in now? Is life going to get better? Is things gonna, are things going to get worse? How, how, because the, it, kind of the, the post-millennial view is that we are going to keep preaching the gospel. We're going to change art and entertainment and, and education yeah. and the, po- the, the political sphere. And that's going to usher in the return of Christ as we, we subject sure. all of these things under Christ's feet. What's the view of the amillennial perspective yeah. in this? Well, I have great respect for the post-millennial view. I have an entire chapter in my book on it, and I cite all the texts that they use to prove their point, but I also have a, a, a critique of it. I, I wish post-millennialism were true. I just don't believe that it is. But then I'm, I'm going to say something that's going to sound contradictory. <laughs> he says, are things going to get better or are things going to get worse? The answer is yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I like obviously that answer. We have, to, we have to describe what things are that we're talking about. The wheat gets wheaty believe. and the chaff gets chaffy. What? <laughs> so, the, I, the, the way that I explain it is the wheat gets wheatier and the chaff gets chaffier, right? Yeah. Like that's that's the way it's going to uh, go down. <laughs> I do not believe, uh, like virtually all post-millennialists, that the, that the world is going to be Christianized okay. and that culture is going to be transformed and that political uh, entities and government and education and entertainment and finance are all going to be redeemed and come under the authority of Christians and, and um, reconstructed according to biblical principles. I wish that were true. I, I, I can almost say I hope it is, but I don't believe the Bible says it will be. I think things will continue to deteriorate. I think things will get to continue to get worse and worse globally. At the same time, hmm. I think the church will experience great revival and renewal, an increase of supernatural power. I think the Spirit of God is going to move in, in, in remarkable ways, it, it's, it, it's kind of like, here's the way I describe it. Um, I think the closer we get to the second coming of Jesus, we're going to see common grace withdrawn. And what I mean by that is the restraint that is exerted on the hearts and the behavior of unbelievers by the Holy Spirit that keeps them in check, as it were, is gradually going to be lifted. And the, the wicked propensities of the unregenerate heart are going to be manifest ever more and in greater degree as we approach the end of the age. But simultaneous with that withdrawal of common grace, there's going to be an extraordinary outpouring of special grace, saving grace, supernatural grace on the church. So I think we're going to see a global revival. At the same time, we see cultural, political, educational deterioration. So I see a a both and here. I think I don't think the world is going to be uh, transformed uh, by Christians and by the power of the gospel, although nobody's going to—I'm certainly not going to object if that happens. Praise God. Uh, But but I do do believe that the church is going to flourish even in the midst of massive uh, martyrdom and oppression and and political persecution and personal persecution. I think the church will flourish and grow, and I think we will even see a global harvest— at the same time that we're seeing global decay and deterioration. Hmm. So do you believe the period of tribulation is everything from pretty much when Jesus died and rose again until the end of time? Or do you believe in like a literal seven-year kind of tribulate? Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. And you all are jumping all over the place here. This yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. We get, you know, uh, got to keep those people online, you know. Yeah. They're, okay. They're scattered. I believe that the great tribulation that Jesus describes in Matthew 24 has already come and gone. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a fact of, his, of history, not something that is yet to come in the future. I believe the great tribulation was the period from 33 to 70 AD, and primarily the last three years from about 66 or 67 to 70 AD, when Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was leveled uh, to the ground. I do also believe, however, that the entire church age in which we live is a period of great tribulation. I think we are we are seeing 
uh, you know, the same scenario that we saw in the first century is unfolding in the present age. Uh, so I can talk about the Great Tribulation as something that's already come and gone, but also Great Tribulation is yet to come upon the earth, and the people of God will suffer persecution, martyrdom, oppression. In fact, I think Revelation 11 it teaches us that the church will seemingly go under. There will be a time when it will appear that the church has died. Its witness, its voice, its influence will have been uh, crushed, only then to come alive uh, in conjunction with the second coming of Jesus, I think, and witness a global harvest. So, answering your question, the Great Tribulation, it's already come and gone, pertained primarily to what took place in the destruction of Jerusalem, but we are in a season of Great Tribulation, and I think it will only increase the closer we come to the second coming of Christ. I do not believe there will be a literal seven-year period in which this great tribulation occurs. By the way, let me just say this. If you and I were able to talk to our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Sudan and in India and in North Korea and in Iran, and we talked to them about a great tribulation coming, they would look at us like, are you kidding me? We have no idea what our brothers and sisters have been suffering and are suffering now. It could not get any worse for them than it already has been for these, these many years. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a, a reflection of this Western 21st century uh, mentality of entitlement where we think, oh, my goodness, it's going to get really bad. God's going to get us out of here before we suffer. That is so offensive. Mm -hmm. to the brothers and sisters in Christ throughout history who have suffered horrifically at the hands of unbelievers and are suffering even worse in the present day. Mm -hmm. So the idea that, oh, there's going to come this time in the future where it's going to be a great tribulation, well, go to North Korea mm -hmm. and ask them what they've been suffering for the last several decades. Go to mm -hmm. Iran and ask them what they're enduring when they're thrown into prison and tortured and beaten and all their properties confiscated. I know I'm saying I'm preaching a sermon. I'm sorry. Uh, no, you're good. I, just, you're I good. really get frustrated with, um, with Western mentality of, oh, let's wait for Jesus to come and deliver us from the, the persecution that's to come. Uh, mm -hmm. The persecution has come. It's been here for 2,000 years. Um, and I, I can't imagine for those people that could get any worse than it already is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So earlier you talked about just an understanding the uh, the the series of three sevens in Revelation with the the seals, the trumpets, the bowls. Uh, I think that I wrote down the phrase you used that these commonplace life. I think was the the phrase that you used yeah. that that basically do you do you believe that these represent something that's happened with any form of increase, some form of increased intensity relative to what it was before Jesus came, before he, there yes. was the vision of the open seal? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I think Revelation bears that out because it talks about uh, one-fourth of the earth was struck. And then later it says one-third, and then later it talks about mm -hmm. one-half. There seems to be a broadening intensification of these judgments the closer we come to the second coming of Christ. So when I say that the seals, trumpets, and bowls describe the commonplaces, what I mean is I think all seven of those three series of judgments have already been poured out from the time of Christ's exaltation throughout the present age, but that we will see them proliferate, increase, multiply, and intensify the closer we come to the second coming of Jesus. Okay. So, so help us out with the the view of the uh, the Antichrist. How how does the amillennial view uh, differ from like uh, the the historic premillennialist view of the Antichrist, or or do they differ? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, uh, I would say probably the majority of amillennialists believe that there will be a single individual emerge toward just toward the end of the age who will somehow orchestrate this global assault against the the Church of Jesus Christ. And I'm not ruling that out. Um, I, I'm not saying that won't happen. But when you read in Revelation, by the way, the word Antichrist never appears in the book of Revelation. It only appears in uh, the Johannine epistles. Um, in Revelation, it's called the beast. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the beast is primarily an image of the corporate opposition to the kingdom of Christ. So 
everything that we see down through the last 2,000 years, um, atheism, um, the, the rampant uh, proliferation of abortion, sexual immorality, all of the opposition um, to the kingdom of Christ that we see in, in philosophy and in finance and in governments, in every conceivable way that culture can be opposed to Christ, that is the beast. Hmm. Now, will there be a single person who emerges at the end of history who will, as it were, embody all the, the principles of the beast of Revelation and lead this orchestrated assault against the church, that's entirely possible. And the reason why I say that is because um, the first embodiment of this principle was Antiochus Epiphanes in the second century BC. Mm -hmm. Then there was Titus, who led the armies of Rome that destroyed the, the temple and the city in 70 AD. And so both of those men are described in terms of the abomination of desolation um, and so could there then be a third manifestation of that kind of individual mm -hmm. at the end of the age? And I think I I'm open to that possibility. I'm not persuaded by it, but I, I certainly could easily be uh, pushed over the edge and say, yeah, I think that that too will will eventually come to pass. Well, even the way that John talks about it, is, it seems as if there's many antichrist spirits, right? Uh, so, I mean, it makes sense uh, to suggest that uh, there have been multiple manifestations or and or will be multiple manifestations uh, of something like sure. this. You get yeah. Thessalonians on. So, well, yeah, I was just looking up 2 Thessalonians where it mentions the man of lawlessness and one of our, uh, one of our yep. viewers commented on it. Uh, we, would you say that the man of lawlessness might be that, what you're talking about? Or do you have a different yes. understanding of that? Um, if you, I have an entire chapter in my book on Second Thessalonians. <laughs> I need to read your book, Doctor Storms. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> no, it's, it actually is on my list, but I got like an 800 page NT Wright book I'm working through right now. You're on the <laughs> you're on the list. <laughs> I have no idea what Second Thessalonians two is saying. <laughs> I go it's... into great detail. I mean, I I take it apart line upon line, word upon word. And I come out at the end thinking, I'm not real sure I understand what this is talking it's about. It's confusing. And yeah. let me explain why. Um, in, uh, you know, Paul talks about uh, that this son of destruction, this man of lawlessness will be revealed, uh, opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, takes a seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And then Paul says this, listen carefully. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now that he may be revealed in his time. Now, my question is simply this. Think with me. If Paul is describing here a man who wasn't going to appear for another 2,000 years, why did he need to be restrained in the first century? Paul says he's being restrained now. In fact, he goes on and says, um, he says, and you know what is restraining him now. In other words, the Thessalonians living in the first century, somewhere what, around in the, in the late 40s, early 50s of the first century, they knew what was restraining the man of lawlessness. But if the man of lawlessness wasn't going to be born wasn't he going to be conceived in the womb of his mother and his father until at least 2,000 years later? How could he be restrained in the first century? That, mm -hmm. that just that boggles Doesn't my mind that Paul, yeah. you know, he says, he says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains. And that just makes no sense to me if we're talking about a person who wasn't going to be born for over 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. So all of that to say, that's the argument that the preterist uses to prove that the man of lawlessness was some individual living in the first century uh, who, who had not yet uh, been revealed in the fullness of his opposition to the gospel. Mm -hmm. I ended up throwing my hands in the air in my chapter on 2 Thessalonians 2 saying, I wish I knew what this was talking about, but quite honestly, I, I have to say, I don't. Uh, it, it is, it's quite baffling to me. So, uh, maybe if you'll read that chapter, you can see the error of my thinking and, and, and help me. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think that's going to happen. I'll tell you what, I couldn't write a 
chapter or even a paragraph of something I don't understand. And like to, to be able to write a whole chapter to say, hey, I don't know. I there's, love it. There's man. wisdom there. It's I'm telling awesome. you. Yeah. It's awesome. But you know, one thing that occurred to me too was earlier in the show, uh, we were talking about, I asked you the question, Dr. Storms, uh, because you had mentioned, you know, maybe the Olivet discourse is this, uh, you said you're open to the fact that it could be a pattern mm. that yeah. plays out over the course of time. Well, it yeah. occurred to me that with regard to the Antichrist, that actually is what happened, where you had the abomination of desolation predicted in the book of Daniel, and it and it played out in Antiochus Epiphanes, and then it played out in Titus as well, and then possibly again. But anyway, that just yeah. no, I just kind of made I'm, that middle connection just now. That's a very good point. It's and entirely possible that that the man of lawlessness, the uh, you know the uh, uh, what's what's he also called the son of destruction, mm -hmm. is a reference both to somebody in the first century and also someone who will appear at the end of history. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious what you think thing. about that with the temple. I, I think I feel like I've heard you say that the temple won't be rebuilt. How can the abomination of desolation happen again if there is no temple? Uh, well, because I think that the Church of Jesus Christ is the temple. Uh, and therefore, opposition and the go ahead and drop your church. go ahead and just We're, drop your. Mic, I walked Dr. right Storms. into that. I walked right into it. Just go ahead. I don't know if you've got one on you. That was pretty uh, good. That actually brings up a great uh, a great another question. Okay, because this I'm I know premillennialists are always coming at you with this, Doctor Storms. Um, well, gosh, you all millennialists, you make everything symbolic, you know. So. I'm not saying that. I'm just, I'm putting it out there. How do you know, inter as an interpretive principle, when to, when something's symbolic and when something is literal? I, I think I heard you kind of hinting at it earlier. You said, uh, you said anytime we see a thousand as a number in the scriptures, it's always a symbolic number. I'm actually interested in some of the examples there, but it, it, is God it owns the cattle on a thousand hills, ah, but not a thousand and one, not, hill. not a <laughs> single <laughs> other <laughs> hill. <laughs> yeah. Thou anyway, but, uh, is that what it is? You, you look for other examples in scripture where, for instance, this kind of symbolism was used or is it, well, figures of speech are very clearly being used here because it, what, what kind of criteria do you use to determine symbolic or literal? Oh, well, yeah, that is, I, I, you know, I keep referring to my book. I have a whole chapter on the hermeneutics of eschatology where I talk about that. It's not easy. I mean, you have to take into consideration all sorts of factors. In other words, one would be, would a strictly physical or literalistic interpretation prove to be impossible or illogical? Um, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, you know, is, is Jesus really a shepherd? Has he got sheep up in heaven, literal sheep? No, we know that that is a metaphor. Um, so that's one way in which we determine that and answer that question. Um, here's the other thing to keep in mind. Just because something is figurative or symbolic doesn't mean it's not real. See, I think what happens is premillennialists and others think that when I say something is figurative, I'm saying it doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. It's kind of you know, ethereal. But that's not the case at all. Things that are symbolic, they're symbolic of something true. They're symbolic of something very real. And so when we keep that in mind, I think it takes a little bit of the edge out of that objection that somehow we're vaporizing uh, uh, things in Scripture. Let me, let me give you another example. I mentioned this at the beginning of the program, um, the new earth. Mm -hmm. I am often asked, well, what do you do about, uh, you know, the, the meek shall inherit the earth? What do you do about all the land promises in the Old Testament? Are you just going to spiritualize them and make it refer to the clouds of heaven? The answer is no. I think it's very literal. It's just the new earth. It's not this present earth. Mm -hmm. We will reign on the earth. We will live on soil and grass with trees and rivers and everything else for eternity. It's the new earth on which we reign in fulfillment of those promises. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, it, it it's too massive of a question to go into to determine, you know, is there some one-size-fits-all hermeneutical principle that tells me this is symbolic or figurative as over against being somewhat more literal? The answer to that is no. It's a, it's a combination of a number of factors that we have to bring to bear on any particular passage of Scripture. Great. 
Great. Hey, well, thank you so much. That, that, I mean, uh, you've answered so many questions here. I know that people have got a lot of other questions in here. We might have to, to do a part two. We might have to, to reach out to you and maybe get some of these questions answered. Uh, but for those of you who are watching, uh, Remnant Radio is a theology broadcast. We broadcast every Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. We would encourage you to tune in uh, next week uh, and have, uh, have a conversation with us about theology. We have tons of pastors and teachers from churches and denominations from all over the world coming in that we stream in. And during Corona, season, we're actually doing quite a bit more uh, broadcasting. So we would encourage you to go ahead and hit the subscribe button so as we have pastors and teachers coming in that you get notifications as we come out with those episodes. Uh, Dr. Storms, again, thank you so much for coming on the program. It is an honor to have you uh, back. Uh, We really enjoyed our conversation on tongues that we had uh, last year uh, and look forward to maybe doing some stuff with you in the future. I'm sorry that we didn't get to drive up to you. The plan was to drive up to Oklahoma City so that we wouldn't have the the, the Skype, uh, but you know, Corona. It likes to ruin everybody's plans. By the way, let's be real honest with our listeners, okay? Mm-hmm. At the beginning, you said we got started late because of technical difficulties. Let's be honest. It's because <laughs> Sam Storms is a technological idiot that didn't know how to get hey. on Skype. That's why hey. we were Technologically <laughs> impaired and technological difficulties are one and the same. You know, well, well you know, I, I like, They're- you know baptize everything in love you can only be an expert at so many things dr storm yeah it's okay. yeah <laughs> it, it's that's uh you know well, you're very kind but yeah uh, technology is not my area of expertise hey yeah. well we're we're thrilled to have you on we even, really are even it's if huge. it's late we'll, we'll have you on next time late too we, we'll take the sacrifice we'll bite the it, bullet it's it, worth it it really is a huge blessing and a huge honor dr storms to interact with you yeah. and, and have you answer these questions thank by you by the way from now on it's always Sam, okay. drop the Dr. Storm. Just Sam. <laughs> Got it. We'll do. For okay. all your listeners, too. Sounds good. Hey, so I'm, I'm curious, though. Uh, Convergence Conference, what's what's the plan with Convergence? Were y'all going to do it this year? Are y'all going to do it next year? I know it seems like it's been every other year. Yeah, it has. Um, we're, we're not doing uh, um, one this year. We do it every other year. So, yes, we our tentative plans are to do something in 2021. We have thought about doing two separate convergence conferences on the same theme with the same speakers and doing them at one in the uh, late spring and one in the late summer and doing them in our own facility. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're, that's still up in the air because we're trying to do some renovations in our building, but uh, yeah, convergence is still a live animal and hopefully it'll uh, reappear um, and uh, we'll certainly let everybody know when that's the case. Yeah, keep us connected. We'd love to, uh, to help you guys promote that. We we love the ministry out yes. there and really enjoyed last year's uh, conference. So, uh, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see you next time. And, uh, uh, crew, just kind of as an outro, let's go ahead and play some of that music that's coming in. Uh, this is uh, uh, Bridge, not Bridgeway Church. You guys are Bridgeway Church. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so you guys enjoy this. Y'all can check us out on uh, Skype. Uh, this is Stonebridge uh, Worship. So you guys go check that out. And if uh, if you're watching, subscribe. I'm looking at the wrong camera. Subscribe to the channel. We'll see you guys next time. Be blessed. Even when I fail, I know.